Okay, so um, are we happy with this? There's one fundamental reason why we cannot be happy with that because, you know, World Trade Center, you know, from a technical perspective, all that it showed us is that sometimes when you do implicit performance and you extend the bounds of the standardization into areas where really you have, you're not truly standardized and you rely on implicit performance, you're hiding the possibility for mistakes, okay? Because you're assuming that it's gonna work, you're taking a step to the edge where you really have not validated everything that you're doing and hoping that it's gonna work. Now, the problem is that because we've been doing for 100 years implicit structural fire engineering, the problem is that we really don't know exactly how much we have stepped out of our bounds, okay? So basically assuming that this will never happen again, even if it will never happen again, is a mistake because we are not assuming that terrorists will hit with aircraft buildings. What we are assuming is that a three-story fire in a fully open floor plan with an innovative design building cannot happen. And we know perfectly well that a three-story fire can perfectly happen, that we have thousands of open floor plan buildings, and we have thousands of innovative structural designs for tall buildings because we're doing every time different things. Okay? The evolution of the skyscraper is extraordinary. And, uh, and we need to be very careful not to ignore that fact. So just as an example, if you look at this, basically eight out of the 10 tallest buildings in the world were built after 9-11. Okay? In about 10 years, nine of those 10 will be replaced with buildings that are already either planned or under construction. Okay? So basically the only one that will remain in the top 10, it will not be the tallest building in the world, will be the Burj Al Khalifa, okay? The Hakil Tower in, um, in Abu Dhabi is gonna be taller, it's gonna be one kilometer high, okay? So basically we're gonna replace all this, so the, the boom of the super tall is gonna be the boom of the hyper tall, and it's not going to change. Why? Because many people have embraced tall buildings as a sustainable way of developing cities. Basically, you're condensing people in a very small area, and fundamentally, you're creating vertical cities where you can work, eat, and live you know, in this exactly the same place. So you're reducing energy costs in transportation, you're minimizing the investment on highways and all sorts of things. So in many ways, the idea of the super tall is an idea that is not going to go away, okay? So, in principle, the boom of the super tall, as I say, is gonna move to the hyper tall. And the big justification that we're gonna have for that is that tall is sustainable, okay? If we use the right materials, if we optimize the structure, we can minimize the investment of materials. Uh, you know, if I build five small buildings that have the same capacity as this building, I will use about three or four times more materials than what I will use if I put everybody in one single tall building. So basically, I can conserve energy better because I can justify in a big building implementing an expensive solution because it gets diluted by the volume of the building. So putting a double skin facade, natural ventilation and all these other things, adding an energy generation power plant in here, all these things become sustainable and justified in a tall building which are not in smaller buildings, okay? So all these things become part of the sustainability agenda and of the idea that we are dealing with a small amount of resources that we have to optimize. Tall buildings are all about optimization and therefore this is not going to go away, okay? Now, look at the challenges. I mean, this is the most inclined building in the world, okay? It is more inclined than the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but this time it was done on purpose. Now, think about the structural constraints that that puts on the building. Is that a standardized building? We were talking about compartmentation, okay? What happens when you have a naturally ventilated double skin facade? You're by definition breaking vertical compartmentation because you want the natural flows to move from top to bottom. So you are basically breaching the first pillar by which we standardized the design of tall buildings. Most clearly, a lot of these buildings will have open floor plans, 
And these buildings now are multiple use buildings, so most likely we'll have a hotel somewhere in here where they would like to put an atrium in the middle. Why they want to put an atrium? Because everybody that rents an expensive room in a hotel has to have a window. So you don't want to put windows in the middle of a, of a building, and therefore that space is unutilized. You'd rather have a hole in there. It saves you materials, makes the building lighter, aesthetically pleasing, has all the architectural advantages you could imagine. So fundamentally, these buildings are going to continue to change, and we're not going to stop that. So let me go a little bit through some of the changes, and then I will ask you a question so that you tell me which one you want me to address. So is our comfort justified? I hope that by now you've reached the conclusion that it's not the case. Okay? The, the, I spent one hour trying to make that case, so I hope that at this point you're not comfortable. Is that okay? So these buildings keep changing, the community keeps evolving, and I think our comfort is truly not justified. So let's go to the concept of the fire safety strategy and let's try to understand uh, what we do and how does a tall building and the changes introducing a tall building affect the strategy. Now, there's nothing unusual about the strategy of a building. As we said in the past, we dealt with a Taipei 101 in exactly the same way that we dealt with a 10-story building. Okay? So we're going to start by thinking about evacuation. This is life safety, most important pillar of life safety, of, uh, of fire safety. So we start by always trying to detect the fire. So a fire is going to start somewhere in here, and we want early detection. Okay? Nobody can argue that early detection is a good thing. Okay? You're going to have design a system in such a way that you get early detection. And in the case of a tall building, the early detection is always going to come accompanied in one way or another with some sort of notification system. Okay? Why? Because fundamentally you're going to have a fire somewhere in here and you're going to have people on top, people in the bottom, and you want them to know at least the, the information that you want them to have. You would like to have a notification system that is going to bring you information to the bottom so when the fire service arrives, they get a sense of where the fire is and they know how to intervene. So together with the detection system, we are normally going to have some form of sophisticated alarm design. Okay? Now, the detection has a performance which normally is being implicit. What we do is, depending on the type of building, we prescribe some sort of detector arrange, arrangement and on the basis of we assume that we're going to get the earliest possible detection. You know, companies that produce novel forms of fire detection will come up with things like the Vesta systems and uh, all sorts of other very sophisticated systems claiming that they get a better performance. Okay? And as an engineer, you need to assess that. So you need to be able to assess if you're gaining something by putting a more complicated system, but that has nothing to do with tall buildings. Okay? It is fundamentally something that is happening here in the compartment of the fire, okay? and I need to detect it, and given the notification system and the complexity of the building, I might make decisions on actually how to sophisticate the detection approach. Now, once you detect the fire in a tall building like this, a super tall building, you cannot afford to have simultaneous evacuation of everybody. Okay? That will create all sorts of problems fundamentally associated to the utilization of the stair. Okay? The stairs in here have to be protected, and if I open too many doors in simultaneous, I lose the protection. In other words, the pressurization of the stair. You pressurize the stair, you put pressure in it so that the smoke remains outside, and that is designed on the basis of a number of open doors. Okay? So if, if you have too many open doors, then you will need fundamentally an aircraft turbine in top, on top of the building to pressurize the stair, and you don't want that. Okay? So basically, you create some form of staged evacuation that is going to displace the people at risk away from the fire you know, into areas of safety. It, depending on how big this thing is compromised, you might actually even send people upwards. And in some places, the strategy is actually to send people upwards. In some parts in Asia, you have refuge floors, for example, where they put people in refuge floors to wait until the firefighters tackle uh, the problem. In some places, you start sending people in a systematic way. The strategies are very different, depends on the nature of the building, but that's so far part of the, of, of the management strategy that you put in place. So crowd management is very, very important in here because you have to keep these individuals happy. 
Okay? Especially in a situation that, for example, is post 9-11, you know, maintaining people comfortable waiting for intervention is not a trivial task. So the management has to be very assertive, very precise, very organized, and very well planned. Because if you don't do all these things, you are going to have instances of panic. You're going to have all sorts of problems that can create you know, casualties and, and losses and whatsoever. Okay? So you have to be very careful that you handle this in a correct way. So all this is the standard basic evacuation strategy that you will find in fundamentally any building, but that is complicated by the complexity of the tall building. Now, then you reach the compartmentation. And the compartmentation is intended to slow the fire growth and to minimize or eliminate smoke spread. And the part that we have ignored in the past is that it is also intended, as I say, to keep the fire localized so that our extrapolation from single element testing is a worst case scenario with respect to global behavior. Okay? So if I manage to keep the fire in a compartment, then I can assume that my single element testing is fundamentally a worst case scenario than the real fire. So I can guarantee that the structure will remain, if designed correctly, it will remain standing. Okay? At the same time, if I eliminate uh, fire growth or slow it enough, the fire will reach more or less burnout before the time you move to the next compartment. And that's what you want, so that you get a single fire in a single floor and you don't have multiple floor fires. Now, if it takes 20 or 30 minutes to move to the next level, which sometimes it happens, it's still okay because it somehow maintains the integrity of the strategy. Now, if the building is super complicated, like a tall, super tall building like this, you might actually be even more rigid in such a way that you never move from the compartment of origin, okay? So the smoke also has to be guaranteed that it's not going to spread because you're going to have people waiting in different sectors of the building. So if you have propagation of the smoke, then you're gonna have a little bit of a problem, okay? So that's the compartmentation aspect of it. And a critical element of compartmentation is maintaining the integrity of the stairs because the stair is your safe environment. People are migrating to the stair for safety. So smoke management has to be guaranteed that no smoke gets into the vertical shafts. This applies also for the lifts because in principle you shouldn't have smoke migrating through the lifts either. Okay? So there's a whole big issue about lift, lift evacuation and one of the technical problems to be solved is how the pressures created by the lift movement can actually affect the smoke management within the, the, the tall building. So, but that's a technical problem that can somehow be solved. So once you have that, then you can create response strategies. And there's the basic first line of response, which is the automatic fire suppression. Now, this is something that I need to emphasize because it's very, very important. Many people believe that the sprinkler is the first line of response. And it is the main component that prevents failure in a tall building. Is that the case? No. Why? Because you have to ask the question upside down, no? What happens if the sprinkler does not work? Is the building going to fall down and everybody's going to die? No, you cannot afford that. Your first line of response is what you have here, together with structural integrity. Okay? The building cannot come down because this is such a complex egress process that takes for so long that I have to guarantee that the building stands in place no matter what until burnout. Okay? And I cannot afford negotiating that one. Okay? And I have to guarantee that in that process, everybody that is inside the building in the safe environment remains safe. So your basic two pillars of fire safety are structural integrity and egress. Sprinklers are the redundancy. So they cannot be traded off. So I cannot trade off sprinklers for structural protection. And I cannot trade off sprinklers for egress, okay? 
I can put sprinklers in combination with a whole bunch of other strategies to create other means of redundancy. I can use sprinklers to create robustness. I can use sprinklers for a number of different applications, but I cannot say something, say to somebody, I'll give you sprinklers if you take the fireproofing off. Because, well, the sprinkler will extinguish the fire, and why do you need the structural integrity? That's what I cannot do, okay? And you wouldn't believe how often that's done, okay? That people trade in sprinklers in exchange for a more expensive form of protection which tends to be fireproofing, okay? And that cannot be done, okay? So sprinklers are the redundancy to the system. And yes, in time, they're the first line of attack because they activate first. So in time, yes, they will come first, but they're not the first line of protection from the perspective of a strategy. They are the redundancy, thus the secondary line of protection. Now, obviously, there's the firefighters, and as we described before, it's all about the ladder. Okay? So depending on the length of the ladder, it limits their capability to rescue people from the building in an external way. So they have to resort to enter the building. The entrance of the firefighters into the building changes two things. The first one is that the whole now intervention time scales are life safety because you have to protect the firefighters. And it is not about the time to evacuate people, but it's the time for the firefighters to do their job that needs to be guaranteed when addressing structural protection. Okay? So it changes the time scales because it forces the firefighters to go in, but it also creates a conflict because in a building of this nature, you will have cross flows. You will have people trying to come down while firefighters are coming in. Okay? It is almost unaffordable in a tall building like this to create a stairwell only for firefighters because the, the square meters that you're losing in a 110-story building you know, for a stairwell is way too expensive. So you cannot afford doing that, so you will have a situation of cross flow. And once again, that brings you back into crowd management. It has to be done in a careful way. So once the firefighters arrive, you privilege their response and intervention activities. Okay? So you will move people in a careful way so that you don't block the activities of the firefighters because they will take, uh, you know, they will take priority over what's going on. Okay? Because they will control the fire, they will stop the event. So in that sense, you're giving them priority. Once people are in a safe environment, they take second level of priority and the firefighters take the first level of priority. So it changes that. So at the end, all this is subject to our capability of keeping structural integrity in the building. Without structural integrity, nothing works. Okay? So that's it. There's nothing different to any other building. It, yes, it is a little bit more complicated. It brings a lot of things. And I know that you've seen every single one of the things. And actually, you've probably seen even this drawing. Okay? So you know every single one of the things. So in principle, if I manage to do what I said I was going to do, which is compartmentalize the fire correctly, okay, then everything that you apply to any other building will be more or less the same with some add-ons of crowd management and a few things here and there. Okay? But basically, the principles are the same. Now, that brings us to, to the big question. No? So if I keep the compartment, and if I keep the rules of the game, and I have a standard building, I really don't need to worry, but the truth is that that is not necessarily always the case. This is what our standard strategy was designed for. It was designed for a space that looked like this. A small compartment, office type of compartment, with a standardized fuel load, with a typical level of ventilation that leads to what we define as a fundamental pillar of fire safety, the compartment fire. Okay? The compartment fire is the basic principle by which we design every component of our strategy. Okay? All our strategies are designed against a compartment fire. Okay? So that's all fine if your building can look like this. But the truth is that, unfortunately, that's not the case. And very rapidly, in the 60s and 70s, we migrated to this. How does that change things?
Does it change anything? Hmm? For example? Okay, so you have a very, very big area. Okay, but the fuel load is per meter squared. So actually, on average, the fuel load has not changed. Yeah, but the fact has spread more easily from one fuel load from one thing to another. Yeah, so the fire is going to start spreading, no? And it's going to move along, and it's going to burn for 15 minutes or 20 minutes locally, heating up the structural element here, but then it's going to move to the next level. And the smoke now is going to preheat the structure and it's going to change a lot of different things in here. And, uh, and it doesn't work the way I planned it anymore, no? Uh, would the performance of my smoke detection change? Would I have to worry about redesigning the detection of this compartment? What does smoke detection depend on? the quantity of smoke that reaches the detector, no? So as you move up, basically the smoke is diluted and eventually it creates a ceiling jet and that ceiling jet is going to somehow, at some point, see the detector. And once the concentration reaches a certain level, the detector activates. But it's a very early on process, no? So the fire is not fully developed. The fire is in the development stage. So it really doesn't matter, okay? Because it's well ventilated, and being in a compartment or being in an open floor plan is really not going to affect my detector very much. No, more or less the same. And we can say the same thing about sprinklers, and I'll, and I'll get into that in more detail later. Okay? But from a structural perspective, I lost compartmentation. So now I'm going to have structural elements that are being preheated along the length of the system. And they're, being loose, they're going to start losing restraint. And then I'm going to get into a phase of cooling that is going to start contracting in one side while it's expanding on the other side. Typical scenario, for example, for shear failure of concrete columns, where you actually have one side pulling in this direction, the other one side in this direction. So the two of them are going like this, and eventually, you know, you push the column out of the seat and you break it. Those things cannot happen in a fully restrained compartment. So, yeah, there are changes. No? They are quite significant. Now, what happens if this happens now? That's a modern 21st century building. Now you have several layers of offices all burning as open floor compartments, all spilling the smoke to the ceiling. So you have like a chimney bringing all the heat to a set of structural elements that are in the upper floor. So you have fairly cool, fairly cool, fairly cool, super hot. Globally, because now the chimney is the entire atrium in the middle. So the entire upper floor now is being heated homogeneously by an enormous amount of energy. How long do you think all this fire is going to burn? 15 minutes like it was in the little compartment? Hours, hours and hours, no, why? Because yes, it's burning 15 minutes locally, but it's moving along through the entire building and it can burn eight, nine, 10 hours. And in those eight, nine, 10 hours, there will be some structural elements on the top that are gonna be permanently heated for a very, very, very long period of time. So you see, there's big changes, no? So these are the kinds of things that are happening today. Look at curtain walls. I love this building. This is the Aqua building in Chicago. It's a brand new building but it has a, a very interesting conventional uh, aspect to its design, which is basically the fact that the floors represent barriers between you know, the two stories of the building. So the separation between the fire here and the fire here is a concrete slab, okay? So if I design my concrete slab to withstand fire for a certain period of time, I know that that is going to be my barrier. So this building, despite the fact being sort of like a ultra modern design, is actually designed on a very conventional basis, which is having the concrete floor represent the vertical compartmentation. So what you have is a system like this. So here's your fire, fire is burning. You're gonna create some sort of protective elements here 
that are going to disable the breakage of the glass. But fundamentally, your barrier is the concrete floor. Okay? And the concrete floor can be designed to represent an effective barrier that actually keeps the fire from penetrating from one floor to the other one. Now, then take Norman Foster's gherkin, you know, the Swiss RE building in London. Okay? So, beautiful building, no? You know, it looks a lot more modernistic, not as classic and, and uh, uh, interesting as the aqua building. But, uh, but here you have, what is the difference between these two? This particular system is actually a system that has a continuous uh, curtain wall. The curtain wall now is basically the barrier between the fire here and the upper floor. Is that a bigger challenge? What do you think can go wrong here? The hmm? the failure of the system. Okay, so how can the system fail? Let's think about it. How can it fail? I have standard tests that enable me to create sufficient protection here and here in such a way that the flames that get to the glass have low enough heat flux that they will not penetrate. So when, when these curtain walls are tested, they're tested against a compartment fire that is very similar to this, okay? And that is going to spill, and I have to demonstrate that the fire will not break the glass on top. So I've sort of solved that problem with a test. What else can go wrong? What happens here? How do I fix this problem? Here I'm going to have some sort of metal fixation between the curtain wall structure and the concrete slab. And what, what am I going to do to block the passage of the fire? Huh? Insulation. Yes, you're going to put fire stops. Okay, so you're going to fill with insulation in here and you're going to test that against the temperature time curve to make sure that actually it resists as many hours as the concrete slab resists. So in principle, I have created a system that is equivalent to the concrete slab. Okay? So in principle, I should be fine. But in practice, what am I missing? What am I missing in practice? What happens when you heat a structure, especially if, the, if it's an open floor plan, and you, know, you have this atria in the middle, all these strange things that we just saw? What will happen with that structure? Hmm? It will weaken, that's one. What else will happen? It will deform. It will deform. What happens when it deforms? Can I reproduce in a test the deformations associated to the global behavior of the structure, when the fire can actually carry a very significant portion of the building? No. So you have deformations that are potentially very unusual. And what can happen when you get, for example, relative deformations, this concrete slab curving in this direction, for example, the heated direction, and this curtain wall expanding and bending like this? You create relative deformations. And what happens with the fire stop? It starts leaving gaps. Okay? So all those things start coming up. So you see, these minor, supposedly minor features that are associated to the way we design buildings today can completely tr transform the strategy because all of a sudden you get vertical penetration. And now we have multiple floor fires. Okay? And that's not a joke. Here you have an example of it. That was a CCTV tower in China. In 15 minutes, you have a poorly designed curtain wall that burned a building from floor to ceiling, to the top, bottom to top, the whole thing. Fortunately, it was empty, filled up the entire building with smoke. It was only an external fire, but if it would have been filled up with people, everybody would have done in 15 minutes out of intoxication. Okay? The, even the furniture inside didn't burn because the fire never propagated inside. It was only an external fire that filled the entire building with smoke. 
Okay? And those are the potential consequences. Now, if you look at World Trade Center 7, you see the difference? This fire burned for about eight hours. It never moved up and down. Okay? Yes, it had cladding to make it look continuous and all that stuff, but the barrier was the concrete wall or the concrete floor. That was the barrier that separated one from the other one, and this particular building did not experience vertical propagation. So these are the kinds of things that were changing. As you can see, we're losing more and more comfort in what we're doing. Now, the model structure. This is the top of the Swiss Army building. The lightweight, nat oops. the lightweight nature of the structure is extraordinary. The concept of the diagrid is a perfectly innovative way of redistributing loads, mostly designed for wind purposes, but also distributes the formations very nicely. So you can create massive gaps between concrete slabs and the building. More and more, we're transferring loads in a more effective way. More and more, we're making buildings leaner. And more and more, we're using constructive forms that basically privilege, privilege easy to build, OK? Constructability. That's what we're doing more and more. So we are allowing extraordinary shapes that have absolutely nothing to do with the old frame. So our, my concept of restraint now is a huge question mark. I have no idea what restraint is anymore. And I have no idea, actually, how to verify restraint. You know, a structural engineer has to put an enormous amount of effort to be able to verify that a building is actually to some level restrained and transferring loads in a way such that you can allow local failures. Okay? So the model structure is changing, and therefore we have big changes. So if I go back to this, we're in trouble. Now. We have structural problems. We have compartmentation problems. And all that affects my egress because I can no guarantee any more structural integrity. And I can no guarantee any more that the fire is not going to propagate from the bottom to the top. OK? So pick one. I'll, I'll give Grunda the, the whole set of slides. And uh, there's about 70 slides where I tackle every single one of us and show you what are the kind of differences that can happen. But of course, I don't have the time to go through 70 slides, given that it took me about an hour and a half to go through 15. Uh, pick one. Which one do you want me to explore in more detail? Which one do you think is the most fundamental one? Huh? Compartmentation. OK, well, let's look at compartmentation then. Okay. So how does the loss of compartmentation affect the problem? So think about it. You all know this. It's very straightforward. You have a compartment. And the compartment, we know how it behaves. Here's my little compartment. Everything uh, starts you know, fire growth. You have a period that is very low. You have flaming ignition, smoke alarm coming in. The obscuration starts increasing. And, and eventually, your detector you know, activates. You eventually, the temperatures go high enough, about 60 degrees or whatever, until the sprinkler activates. And then you, know, you get the transition to flush over, temperature goes up, and the, you know, the usual thing. Okay? We know. Now, for structural purposes, we're interested in this part. So we assume that once you've transitioned to flush over and you have a fully developed compartment, the compartment mixes perfectly and you can describe the entire compartment by a single temperature time curve. Okay? And a single temperature time curve is going to determine the structural integrity of the compartment. Okay? That's the basic principle. Now, let's look at ignition. If I look at ignition, nothing changes. Because the compartment is much, much bigger than the ignition point. So having a bigger compartment or having a smaller compartment is make, going to make no difference to the fire growth curve at the beginning, OK? Because the walls are so far away from the ignition point that really the ignition point doesn't see the walls at all. So I could have a very small compartment or I can have a massive compartment, 
and for all ignition purposes or early flame spread purposes, there will be absolutely no change. Okay? So my initial fire that will affect the detection system and maybe the sprinkler system will probably be somehow unaffected by the fact that I breached compartmentation. So if I look at the problem, we have a tendency to describe, you know, by means of flammability, ignition, and flame spread, we can construct the value of alpha, which is the fire growth curve, and a very easy way to simulate the fire is the heat release rate alpha T squared. Okay? This alpha value here is a function of the fuel and the thermodynamics associated to the burning, but basically this value here is independent of the boundaries. Why? Because the fire at this stage of the fire growth is deemed to be much smaller than the compartment, so the compartment has very little impact on the fire. Okay? So to this point, the same. Loss of compartmentation doesn't change anything. Okay? So does it change the placement of smoke detectors? Truly not really, because, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to place a smoke detector in the floor. That you know, common sense. Rarely you will put it in the wall, common sense. You normally will put it here, you will put it here, everything remains the same. The rate of smoke production is going to be more or less the same. The height of the ceiling to the floor is more or less the same. So my dilution is more or less the same. So if I take this wall away, it doesn't change anything. Is that okay? So I can eliminate this wall, eliminate this wall, and eliminate this wall, and fundamentally, my smoke detection will be exactly the same. So compartmentation has no impact on my smoke management strategy. Sprinklers. Sprinklers, again, look at it. Sprinklers get activated way before flashover. Okay, they have to activate quite early on in the process. So again, the fire is very small compared to the compartment walls. And the two variables that are going to play a role in the temperature of the gas and in the velocity of the gas, according to the Alpert correlations, which I assume that you've seen, is basically the height of the ceiling and the heat release rate. So as we saw, ignition is unaffected. Flame spread is unaffected, so Q is the same. It doesn't change. So no effect on the Q side. H, if I get an open floor plan, will H change? No. What about an atrium? That's where the challenges start, no? Because even for the activation purposes of the sprinkler, the height is a very important variable. So as you increase the height, the temperature goes down. As you increase the height, the velocity goes down. Lower convective heat transfer, lower temperatures, delayed detection. So if you're changing the height of the compartment, think about what you're doing because the effectiveness of your sprinklers is going to go down because they're going to activate themselves when the fire is much bigger. Because keep in mind that your fire grows with T squared. So if I delay activation, you get a much bigger heat release rate, and therefore your sprinklers have to fight a much bigger fire. So what kind of changes in the compartment are going to affect sprinkler activation? Basically, height. So this compartment and the one that doesn't have walls will have no difference. Now, the other variable to establish performance of the sprinkler is the water density. So normally, depending on the commodity that you have, you will choose a specific water density. And that water density has to be guaranteed by the sprinkler. Now, would the water density change if I change the height? Would the water density change if I change the height? The sprinkler activates produces an umbrella. What happens if I start increasing the height and put the sprinkler higher and higher and higher? The umbrella grows, okay? So most likely, my water density is gonna go down. But it's not a big problem because if I have a high, uh, an increase in ceiling height, most likely the fire is gonna behave closer to an open fire because the walls are so far away that there's no radiative feedback. 
So instead of the acceleration, I'm going to slow down the fire. So maybe there's a compensation effect, but I need to look at it in a careful way. The problem happens when you're dealing with a fully developed fire. Because a fully developed fire, and this is a very, very important one, the fully developed fire is a fire that we use to establish the behavior of our structures. And from the beginning, when people conducted experiments on compartment fires, they split them in two, two regimes. There's this regime for the small ventilation, okay, where you have a perfect mixture in here, and you get what we call the ventilation control fire, that this is the one that we use to calculate structural behavior. But when you make the window too big, then so much air comes in that flow goes in and flow goes out, carrying all the heat to the outside. Okay? That's the second regime, and it's fuel controlled. Here, what controls the temperatures is the burning rate. But most of the heat actually goes out because the flow is so fast that it comes in and out. Well, here, a very small amount of energy gets lost because the air comes in, sticks in there for a long period of time, and only a little bit gets out. So which of the two is going to have higher temperatures? This one. So we've had a tendency to think that this is the worst case scenario, the compartment fire, okay? The ventilation control compartment fire that has higher temperatures. So from the beginning, and these are the curves by Thomas from the 1970s, he split the problem in two. And this is fundamental, okay? And please, if anything you take away, think of what I'm going to say right now, because this is absolutely fundamental, okay? If you look at this plot here, assume that the temperature is the criteria that I'm going to be using for structural design, okay? So if I look at this plot here, this side here is regime one, which is the case where you are ventilation controlled. Very low opening factors, okay? The other side, this one, is regime two, which is the case where you actually have fuel controlled, the flow comes in and comes out, okay? So as I said, this case, because the flow comes in and leaves so rapidly, carries all the energy so the temperatures are much lower. This case, the flow stays spinning in there until it gets all the oxygen consumed, and therefore the temperatures are much higher. So as designers, what do people do? The ventilation factor has on the top the total area of the compartment. On the bottom has the area of the ventilation times the height to the square root, okay? So if I'm a designer and I want to design a structure and I want to take the temperature that I'm going to use for structural design, where do I want to be? Either here or here. Is that okay? Because it's the lowest temperatures, no? I'm never going to be here, because what does that mean? All that it means is I have no windows, okay? Nobody will buy the idea that the glass is not gonna break, and nobody will construct a building that has no windows, okay? So the capability that I have of going in this direction, okay, is very little, okay? Now, on the other hand, what do I need to do to go in this direction to make this ventilation factor very small? I need to increase the area of the windows, okay? So what people say is, let's make a system where I can guarantee that the windows will break and I will design a building on the basis of a very large broken glazing. Is that okay? Yes or no? So if I have guaranteed broken glazing, I go in this direction, temperature goes down, okay? So here you are, and you can design for 700. Is that okay? Instead of designing for 1,000. That makes a huge difference in structural terms. Steel at 700 
at least has almost half of his capacity. At 1,000, he has none. Okay? So it makes a huge difference. Now, is going in this direction valid? This is where compartmentation means a lot. Is it valid? Is it valid as a designer to argue that you're going to use the breakage of the glazing to make sure that your temperatures go down so you can design your structure to a lower level of fireproofing? Why not? The plot says it. I'm using experimental data. Why not? No, it has nothing to do with the fire. This is my compartment fire, and I'm just getting the temperature that is deemed by that level of ventilation. If you read the paper by Thomas, 1972, you will find out that what Thomas said was that when you look into this scenario here, this one, all he does is an energy balance. Oxygen comes in, gets all consumed, energy gets generated, is lost through the walls in part, and whatever is left is used to increase the temperature. Okay? It's just simply an energy balance. Energy in as a function of oxygen concentration, or the amount of oxygen that comes in, gets released, either it goes through the walls or stays in there. Because it spins around so much, the losses through the plume are negligible. Okay? That's what he assumes. And he gets the theoretical straight line. Okay? Then Thomas says, in the event that you have a lot of ventilation, in a small compartment of 4 by 4 by 4 as his tests, the flow goes in, starts burning, but leaves the compartment very early. Okay? So it carries most of the energy and burns mostly outside. So the temperatures are very low. And he insists, but the problem with this is that this is a complex fluid mechanics problem that fundamentally is integrally dependent on the size of the compartment. Because if I get the compartment to be much deeper, then it takes a lot longer for the air to go in and go out. So all the combustion happens inside the compartment, and all the energy remains trapped inside the compartment. Now, if you look at his plot with a little bit more attention, you will find that he has points here at 1,100. Those are the long compartments. Okay? So he says, well, this area here, okay, I cannot describe it with theory, it is fundamentally linked to the compartment size, okay? And therefore, should never be utilized, okay? Nevertheless, in current buildings, 1970, compartments are like this. So we are safe going with this side because this represents the nature of the buildings we are studying. So what is the fundamental premise of what he's saying? All this is valid if you have a compartment fire. And if you don't? That's the fundamental principle of fire safety. Everything that we do is based on compartment fire dynamics. That basically means everything that we do corresponds to regime one. If we have a big compartment, we're not in regime one anymore. And all the energy, because it cannot move in and out, is not going to go and go here, but it's going to continue the theoretical curve because it's going to be accumulated inside the compartment. It doesn't have enough time to go away. It is transferring heat to all the structural elements, so it stays inside the compartment. Your compartment, the bigger it gets, the more adiabatic it becomes. Okay. So the closer you are to the hypothesis that there's no losses to
to the outside. And therefore, your theory is more and more following this line. So then why are we designing buildings using 600 degrees? Because the glazing breaks. Because we forgot. That's the problem. Okay? That's the fundamental problem of not thinking of where things come from. That's the fundamental problem of having people that are not well trained doing these kind of things. Okay? Because they forget the very basic principles under which all this theory was developed. So that's the fundamental message. So I can take any of the problems. You say compartmentation, I do compartmentation. You say sprinklers, I can take sprinklers. You, know, you can say whatever. And at the end, when I bring you back to the basics, at every single stage, we go back to fundamentally the same problem. That we have to understand exactly what we're doing. And if we don't understand exactly what we're doing, we're going to start misinterpreting what other people have already verified. This side of the curve cannot be used. End of the story. Okay? So we cannot use that side of the curve because one, doesn't represent the theory. Two, it is intricately dependent to the nature and geometry of the compartment. And three, it's based on experiments that in number are so small that they don't reproduce the, all the variables that you need to understand. And therefore, the data here is somehow meaningless. Okay? Thomas says it. Kawagoe says it. Hathmarty, that took all this information and brought it to Canada, says it. Explicitly written in every single one of their papers. You know what the new guideline for structural exposure to fire of the Society of Fire Protection Engineers in the United States uses? Regime 2. They allow you, based on the ventilation factor, to reduce the maximum temperature and use data of Regime 2. You know what year was our guideline published? 2010. Okay? And they reference Thomas, which is the saddest part of the story. So anyway, that's what I mean. Okay? So this one, one example, and as I say, Grunda will have all the other ones. We want to look at all the others. There's an analysis based on breaking the compartment of every single one of these components. Okay? And you can tell where the weaknesses are, where the failures are, and, uh, and get a, a better sense of the problem. So let me go back to where I was originally. OK. So basically, at the end, the question remains the same. No? So you know, the truth is that life losses in fire are very small. So basically, nobody cares. Financial losses are very small. Nobody cares. Can we justify change? Do we need change? I mean, the truth is we do need change. It's absolutely obvious. Okay? We're still treating buildings as standard buildings. They're not. We're using our theory the wrong way because people are not competent enough to use the theory correctly. We're not training. We're not educating people to enough number, of, number or quality to actually do this. So we are in a limbo of ignorance. Okay? Assuming that our implicit level of safety is fine. Okay? But the truth is that we actually do need change. And again, this is the final message that I want to give you. It is how do we actually justify change? And the justification of change, I think it is very important because the truth is that we do need the change. And we have to be very careful to argue our case in a manner such that is responsible. It is not about cutting costs, and it's not about oversimplifying things. It is about understanding the problem and bringing the correct change. The problem that we have is that when we deal with tall buildings today, we are still designing for implicit performance. Okay? And the design for implicit performance fundamentally means that one size fits all. Okay? So buildings are not falling down from the sky, and that's perfectly clear, which basically means that if I have the 110 stories building right, I must be completely overdimensioning the 10 story building. No? How come two systems that now seem to be so different and so complex, le different in level of complexity, can actually be designed in the same way? Now, if you look at the importance and the pervasiveness of this mentality of one size fits all, it fits every single component of the fire strategy or the building process. 
You know, we have completely forced the architects to standardize space. You know, the whole idea of means of escape, the fire doors, the corridor dimensions, the distances between doors, all the same puts enormous constraints on architects that actually don't want to do the same. So they're pushing permanently to break the rules. And they're winning. Okay? They are breaking the rules because we cannot justify what we're doing because we have an implicit level of performance. So constantly, it's not that I'm saying move out of the code. No, what I'm saying is that we're already doing it. You know, when we put this type of constraints, we're already moving outside the code, and that is a fact. So we are forcing compartmentation, but they don't want compartmentation. So we're already moving away from compartmentation anyway. So we come in and we claim we have to put these compartments, we have to put these firewalls, we have to do this. The architects scream, you know, everybody's complaining, it's not sustainable, you're using too much materials, this and that, and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, they are winning because the modern building is losing its compartmentation. You know, you cannot believe to what extent we have an influence on the geometry of a building. Even the way you put light fixtures in a sprinkler building is to avoid blocking the water spray. Because we have a few tests that define the performance of the sprinkler system and they require a perfectly open water spray. The moment you put a ventilation duct or you put a light fixture, you know, then all of a sudden you block the sprinklers. And people have the most wonderful solutions to that. Have you ever seen a ceiling and then a fake false ceiling which is full of holes like this, all the ducts in here, and to avoid having the sprinkler in the ceiling that is blocked by the ducts and the lighting and all that, they put a tube that goes down, okay, with the sprinkler hanging in there in the middle with a little receptacle. Why? Because the receptacle is going to capture the smoke and it's going to activate the sprinkler. You know what the term for that is? You know, I could use a much stronger one, but nonsense is good enough, okay? Go to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. The whole airport full of them. Go to Frankfurt. You go to Shanghai. Why? Because the primary purpose is to avoid blocking the spray. Now, what is the only scenario in which the sprinkler is going to activate? When the fire is right underneath, no? Even then, I'm not sure. Okay? So there's a few slides about Alpert correlation and when it's valid and when it's not valid, okay? But what is the probability of the fire to be right underneath the sprinkler head? Zero, okay? Most likely the fire is gonna be somewhere away from the sprinkler head, the smoke is gonna go to the ceiling, and by the time it fills an enormous space, your fire is gone. The sprinkler will never activate, okay? So basically the constraints on geometry are massive. And we don't even know. Architects have assimilated them so well that they don't even think about it anymore. Immediately, flat ceilings. Why? Well, the sprinklers don't work if you have an angle greater than that. I cannot have an inclined ceiling. Okay? Ceiling height, this height. Why? Because the sprinkler activation gets delayed if you increase the height. You know, lightning has to be there. Everything has to be somehow constrained by the geometries imposed by fire safety. So, the same thing with response. I mean, the sprinkler heads, you know, we put sprinklers in the most unbelievable places. We already saw height is critical into the performance of the sprinklers. So why would you have a sprinkler in a building like this? I mean, why would you put a sprinkler with this level of ceiling height? It would never work. By the time the sprinkler activates, the fire is gonna be so big that there's no point in having the sprinkler. Nevertheless, one size fits all. Do you know what the safety factor for the water amount is for a sprinkler system? How, much, how many more times water we put in than what we need to kill the energy released by the fire? 10,000, more or less. Why? Because one size has to fit all. Think of the waste level that that imposes. I mean, obviously, water mists are a much more effective system but it requires a lot more work, a lot more understanding, a lot more everything. We're not willing to invest on that, okay? So water mists are li lingering in there, and the only reason why they haven't taken over sprinklers is because we have not developed them to a level such that we understand their performance. 
Okay? But it's a much more effective system that uses about 100 times less water than a sprinkler. Already there, you have two orders of magnitude less. Okay? Fireproofing. Yes, we have one size fits all. Worst case fire for the longest period of time. Blah, blah. Do you imagine how much greenhouse gases are introduced in fireproofing that is unnecessary? If you're talking about sustainability of green buildings, the level of waste in what fireproofing concerns is enormous. People have proved that for many systems, for example, none of the secondary elements need to be fireproofed. Okay, they don't add anything to the performance of the building. So why do we keep putting it? Because one size fits all. Okay? And of course, there's a fire service. And I don't, I'm not critical of the fire service, but look at the size of the hose. I mean, if the sprinkler was 10,000 times a safety factor, think about it. Why? Because these individuals are risking their lives, and they have to attack all the fires. And I have to create a system where one size fits all. Okay? That's the way we operate, because we have an implicit performance analysis. So the bottom line is that we have, as a consequence, an enormous set of safety factors. And that's what matters. The investment that we make in fire is extraordinary. It's an absolutely extraordinary investment. It's not the losses. The losses are negligible. <coughs> Do you have a flood brigade? Do you have an earthquake brigade? Do you have a hurricane brigade? We do have a fire brigade, you know that, no? Okay? It's, you know, I'm not claiming that we have to eradicate the fire brigade. I'm claiming that we have to address performance in a better way. Because otherwise, you know, we're doing things as absurd as this. Loss of function. Do you have any idea who would use that stair? People that go in, go out the same way. If you force them to get out of a window to get to an external stair just to meet the minimum distances for egress or the maximum distances for egress, this is going to be a hideous ornament. Nobody uses it. It's there, it ruins aesthetics, it wastes material, loses its function, okay? But it's there because one size fits all. You compromise aesthetics. The architect wanted a nice feature spiral staircase and we told him no box it in fireproof glass because the smoke cannot go in. True, we don't want the smoke to penetrate vertically. But can we find something a little bit better than that? I can guarantee you we can if we forget that we have to use the same rules for every single building. So the aesthetics get compromised. That's why the architects hate us. And they have right. Look at the waste. Every time you deploy a fire protection foam system, you have a massive amount of foam being deployed. And you know what's in that foam? A triple F. And FFF stands for chlorinated, chlorinated, or fluorinated, 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 which is halogen, halogen, halogen. And that is a huge environmental cost. And we ignore it. We just throw all the stuff because, you know, we have to fit everything with one single size. So the worst, and this is the point of the entire lecture, is even after all that waste, even after ruining the life of the architects, even after destroying the environment, and even after spending everybody's mind, money left and right, we still leave all these identified, unidentified mistakes hanging left and right. Okay? The standardized, one-size-fits-all, implicit performance for tall buildings will always inevitably lead to unidentified mistakes. Why? Because the moment you move a little bit away from the standardized solution, you take the risk of not fitting the premises of the standardized solution. So the bottom line is what is the alternative? So that's the sad part of the whole thing. The problem with the bottom line, the alternative, is that this is completely unsustainable, and we eventually, for tall buildings, we have to move away from this. And even if we don't want to, they're dragging us out anyway. Okay? None of our buildings are standardized. They're all prototypes. Okay? So bottom line, this is unsustainable, this is going to disappear, and either we follow and try to do something right, or we're going to be put in the boot and driven away you know, wherever the rest of the industry wants to drive us in this kind of situation. So the problem is the alternative. Okay? This is, you know, people, we want the alternative, the real thing, is to design for explicit performance. Okay? The problem is that this is not easy. Okay? 
That's the problem. Everybody believes that performance-based design is to design for explicit performance. That's wrong. Performance-based design is about competence. Okay? Performance-based design is about knowing what you're doing. Performance-based design is having a properly accredited engineer that actually perform as an engineer. But unfortunately, that engineer really doesn't exist because this is an incredibly complex problem that requires a team of professionals that can start from the material science. You have to look into how materials melt, what the flammability of the materials is, how they're going to burn. You have to understand how the smoke is transferred. You need to understand computational fluid dynamics. You need to understand the characteristics of burning compartments, the fire dynamics of the problem. You need to know how the smoke and the heat is going to be transferred. You know, you need to know all the fluid mechanics and heat transfer that will enable you to calculate how smoke and heat get transferred to the structure so that then you can actually look into the solid mechanics and establish why you get these deformations, the local failures, the column failures, and all these other things, which forces you to go into try to understand people so you can engineer them out of the picture, okay, by designing a system that is robust enough that is not affected by this physiology, the psychology, and the sociology of individuals, you want to design systems that really are immune to all these things. As engineers, that's our job. The error bars here are way too big to be predictive. So the bottom line is that at the end, all this information that comes from fundamental science through many different aspects of engineering is a huge task that is not one individual to be able to deliver it. So the problem with all this is a matter of competence, is for us to define what fire safety engineering is all about and who is competent to actually deliver it. Because at the end, we need to inform the designers, the architects, who don't understand the intricacies of the problem. And that's the key. We cannot allow the architect in a problem of this complexity to make the decisions if a structure is going to stand or not. The implicit performance criteria that we had does not work for the unconventional structure. So therefore, the architect does not have the competence to make those decisions. The design has to be deeply influenced by this high-level knowledge that comes from the engineer. So that's where really the problem is. And it's not about the regulatory law. It's not about creating new rules and regulations. It is about educating people to be able to use regulatory law or rules and regulations as one extra tool together with all this to inform the design process. Okay? This is the difference between a prescriptive environment where the rules are the law of the land as opposed to a performance-based environment where the rules are just one extra tool for the competent professional that can actually handle all this information. So at the end, that is what we want, quantifiable safety factors, and that is what is sustainable. Okay? But it relies on this enormous level of understanding that basically does not reside in one individual that forces us to change our framework, and it truly forces us to rethink what fire engineering is all about. So at the end of the day, the big picture message of this whole thing is what performance-based design is. Performance-based design is the dialogue between competent professionals. The moment you don't have that dialogue, you don't have performance-based design. And performance-based design goes as a dialogue at both ends, the regulatory authority, the building uh, engineer, everybody that participates in the process needs to be competent if we're going to be using this type of a model. That's where the crux of the problem is. This is why we're not moving along, is because we have not created the mechanisms to educate competent people to a level, in a way, and in a number that is absolutely consistent with the level of the challenge that the industry has put on us. So bottom line, that's the message. Performance-based design is a dialogue between competent professionals. Thank you.